to hear the children of God just fellowshipping together. Well, we are continuing in the book of Acts, and we are in Acts 27 tonight, nearing the end of Acts. And um, the title of my message is How to Weather the Storm. We all go through storms. And there's a wonderful piece of scripture we're going to study tonight, seeing Paul go through storms and seeing um, incredible principles of how to weather the storm. Before we get there, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for this wonderful time that we can just spend in your word, contemplating, growing, hearing from you. And I pray, Lord, that this will not only be words that we read once and forget, but it will become seed in our hearts that will change how we live so that we will be focused on your kingdom and have a living hope even in times of storms. And we honor you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Acts 27, Paul is on a ship headed for Rome. Now you'll remember that he was held a prisoner in Caesarea for two years without any charges being brought against him. So when Paul saw that there would be no justice, he said, I want to appeal to Caesar. So the Roman governor said, you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. So Paul was put in the charge of a Roman centurion who was responsible to get him to Rome. So they set sail from Caesarea, but along the way they encounter a storm so severe that they are shipwrecked as they try to run their ship on the beach. The thing is, there will be storms in life. If you've lived long enough, you'll know there will be storms. Now, sometimes it is by our own doing. Sometimes it is the result of the choices of others. But sometimes it is just part of life. It just is. And it's at times like these, times of storms, that we must be able to weather the storm. See, storms affect our faith. Storms want to shipwreck our faith, and it can be in many forms. It can be a tragedy in your health. It can be a problem in your finances. It can be a problem in relationships. It can be a marriage that you're struggling with, marriage on the rocks. It can be so many things, the death of a loved one. All of us go through seasons of storms and difficulty. But you can go through storms and even shipwrecks of life without having your faith be shipwrecked. Amen? Amen. See, someone once said, faith that cannot be tested is faith that cannot be trusted. Faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. It's easy to say something with the lips, but you need to put your money where your mouth is. Now, these verses are about having faith that grows stronger even in the midst of storms. Do you believe that's possible? We will see from this passage how choices influence life, but also how God can perform His purpose even in the midst of our storms. Now, I know we've spoken about this topic so many times, but we need to be reminded of this so many times because the moment that you're in a storm, it seems like you're forgetting everything. We need to remind ourselves of these things. So let's go through the scripture, and we will be reading from uh, Acts 27. I'm going to start from verse 8 up to 44. So they're on the ship now, and then with difficulty, sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Now, when considerable time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. So this was a time they were going into winter time, and it was very dangerous to sail. And he said to them, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, 
the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So when a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. But before very long, they rushed down from the land a violent wind called Euroquillo. So this means a northeaster wind. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Isn't that what sometimes happens when we're in a storm? It seems like I just cannot stand against this. Let's just go with it. So running under the shelter of a small island called Clora, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. That was the, um, the little, uh, what do you call it? Lifeboat. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they laid down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo, throwing it overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. But when the 14th night came, so they were on the sea for two weeks, and we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, and a little farther on they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea, on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. Now all of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they'd eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. When day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind, they were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern began to be broken up by the forces of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, 
kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. What a wonderful piece of scripture. Word of hope. So firstly, what we see in this text is that choices have consequences. See, as they were sailing with great difficulty, they came to a place called Fair Havens. Now, I submit to you, a place isn't called Fair Havens for no reason. It means it is a fair haven. It's a great place to be in a, in a port. So, they were at this port for a considerable time, but it seems like the people were becoming itchy and did not want to stay at this port for the whole winter. Now, we read in this version in this um, translation that we're reading that it was not suitable for wintering but the king james translates suitable as commodious in other words it gives the idea that this was a small port that did not have all the things needed for sailors to keep themselves comfortable through the winter months they wanted to get to a bigger port to phoenix a harbor of crete where there are more things to do so, here we see the sailors making a wrong choice. We know it's wrong because Paul even told them, warned them, this is wrong. Now, we can learn from their example and see the effect of their wrong choices. The first thing we see is listen to wisdom. Verse 10, Paul was cautioning them with wise words. He was perceiving that this voice, which would result in damage and great loss, not only to the ship and the cargo, but he said, guys, even we might die. Now, this is important. This wasn't a prophetic word by Paul. Paul wasn't saying, thus saith the Lord. If we go on this journey, we will all die. That's not what it was, because that's not what happened. This was just wisdom. Paul was warning them and saying, guys, this is not the right thing to do. You're putting us all in danger because we all know that the sea is rough this time of year. Don't do it. But it seems like the centurion who was guarding Paul had quite a deciding say in what would happen because the Bible said he didn't listen to Paul, but he decided to listen and were persuaded by the captain of the ship. You see, this was foolish because they were not directed by wisdom but governed by their own wisdom, if I can put it in brackets. Their own wisdom and their own desire. They were safe where they were, but they got itchy. We desired to go somewhere else against wisdom. See, sometimes our own desires lead us into storms. Proverbs 14, 12 says, we know this well, there's a way which seems right to a man, but the end of it is the way of death. How many have made their own decisions and then said, oh God, please bless my decision. And then things go wrong and you say, God, why do things go wrong? See, here's the principle. God blesses his purpose and we need to align with his purpose. See, it's the other way around. It's not just do whatever you want and pray and say, God, please bless this. No, God, what do you want me to do? I align with your plan. Then it is blessed. Paul knew that he was supposed to go to Rome. God told him. That's why he was on this journey. See, James 1.14 says the following. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now I want to frame this a bit differently, this scripture. Read it from this context. When carried away by our own lust, lust is something that you are longing for. So I'm, when people are carried away by their own longing, it gives birth to sin. What does sin mean? To miss the mark. 
So many times people are drawn away by their own longing and they miss the mark of God in their lives. That leads to dead things. It brings death, dead works, things that are not aligned with God's plan. Do you know that you can do a good thing and it still be dead works? If it's something that is not God-ordained, it can still be dead works. So we need to align with God. See, these men were not following Paul's counsel, but were leaning on their own understanding. Now, we are called to live differently. This is where our faith becomes practical because it affects every part of our lives. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. See, people can think they are wise in themselves. I know what to do. But are we aligning with God? Are we asking and trusting God? See, to trust God is wise. And the Bible has a lot to say about being wise. It first of all says the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Standing in awe of God. Saying, God, you are in control. That's the beginning of wisdom. James 1.5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask it of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Proverbs 12.15 says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Now, we should find our counsel from the word and from those who live a life directed by God's word. But see, instead of listening to godly counsel and wisdom, they followed the will of the majority vote. And I want to caution you, beware the majority vote. See, because of the majority vote, many things have gone wrong in the past. Just recently, we were talking about this, and I thought of bringing this up. Um, around about 2007, there was a project that started called the Jesus Project. And it sounds awesome. Jesus, in the name, project, what can go wrong? But see, the problem with this project was it was a lot of scholars and people from different backgrounds and denominations came together and they decided that they are going to go through Scripture and vote on what is true and what is not. I kid you not. So what they would do is, for example, they went from the premise that they don't believe in miracles. So when it says Jesus, for example, healed the blind, they said, well, maybe it was just something in his eye and something happened. So it isn't really true. So they were able to redact most of the things in the Bible because they voted about it. And this shipwrecked the lives and the faith of many people had incredible consequences because of the democratic vote. See, what they did is they put themselves as authority over the word instead of standing under the authority of the word. Now, the Bible does say that there is wisdom in the counsel of many, but it speaks of wise counsel directed by God under the authority of the word. That's where we should find our counsel. See, in the end, we should submit all our ways to the Lord and follow His lead. Our lives should not be led by the democracy of people's opinions, but a theocracy, meaning God has the final say. He is my Savior. He is my Lord, aligned with His word. Amen? Also, I want to caution this. So many people say so many things. Oh, I, God said this to me or God showed me this in a dream or whatever. God will never speak against his word. Amen. Whatever you see or whatever you hear should be aligned with the word because the enemy wants to kill and destroy as well. He comes in like an angel of light and would want to lead you astray. Beware. 
Stay aligned with God's word. Then also, don't lose hope. That's how we weather the storm. Though Paul did not agree with this choice, he didn't have a choice but to continue on this journey because he was a prisoner. So Paul was along for the ride even though he didn't want to be there. Now, it's tempting to think that if you are fulfilling God's purpose in your life, that God should make the sea smooth before you. Yet storms are part of life. See, Paul was in the storm, and it wasn't his doing. Now, some people suggest that if you're going through a storm, it must be because your faith is weak. It must be because you did something wrong. Yet Jesus said we will go through tough things. Now, let's look at Paul's life. So, you will stand with me, and you will agree with me that Paul was called by God. He was following God's direction. He heard God's voice. Amen? Amen. One of the greatest apostles and evangelists ever. So listen to this, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. Paul describes his life. He says, I have been in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. I've even stopped counting, he says, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been in the sea for a night and a day drifting around. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my fellow countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers amongst false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's a daily pressure on me on of concern for all the churches. Oh my word. If someone came to me to the church office and said, listen, this happened to me. I've been stoned these many times. I've been beaten this many times. I've been in danger there. I said, listen, are you hearing God? That's the first thing we'll ask. There must be something wrong in your life. Why is all these things happening to you? And see, this gives me hope. Because Paul says, in the midst of all these things, I am more than a conqueror. I know God is with me. He has purposed me. So just because things are going wrong in your life, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with your faith. Trust in the Lord. James 1, 2 to 3 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Some of the greatest men of faith in the Bible are those who suffered the most in difficult storms. Look at Joseph. Multiple troubles. Look at David. Those with the greatest calling on their lives sometimes endures the greatest storms. As an illustration, many years ago in our life, God was leading my wife and I into a season of trusting God amid incredible opposition. He gave us a direct command, and God even gave us an ultimatum saying that we should follow him on a specific journey. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, but the point is, it was a very hard thing. Because this would mean us swimming upstream against a system that was un. Godly, And we were standing in truth, trusting God that his kingdom would come in the situation. And we knew that this was more than a physical battle. This was a spiritual battle. The enemy was gunning for our ministry and he was trying to shipwreck parts of the kingdom. Now, during this time, incredibly difficult time, One day, I was outside in our backyard, and where we grew up, there's a lot of snakes. I don't like snakes, by the way. If you have pet snakes, don't bring them to me to pet them or anything, please. It's it's not my thing. 
So one day I'm there cleaning the dog's cage and it's fenced off about yay high, what is this, six feet, seven feet fence. And you know what a black mamba is? So there's a 12 foot black mamba coming out of the dog cage, coming straight at me and I'm cornered. And you know, these mambas, they can lift themselves up to two thirds of their body length. So this snake was coming at me like this, coming through the bushes, through the trees, and I'm retreating. And as I'm retreating, it's coming directly for me. And as it lunged for my, uh, for my torso, I had a stick and I hit it over the back. And as I hit it over the back, it curled and fell, and that snake never got up again. I made sure it was dead. I, if, if you are a greenie, I'm sorry, but uh, it was me or the snake. But something happened. In that moment, the scripture came up where David stood in front of Goliath and he said, I killed the bear. I killed the lion. Who are you, uncircumcised one, coming against the God of Israel? And in that moment, God said, you are standing in front of a giant, but I showed you that the enemy is coming for you, but he will not triumph. And I could have stood there and said, God, why? Why the snake? Why is everyone trying to kill me? What's happening? But God spoke into my spirit. And he said, you are going to face something, but I am with you. You see, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of difficult times, we need to stand. Stand on God's word. See, Paul did not lose hope. Even in the midst of these circumstances, he was holding on to God's word because God promised that he will still stand in Rome. He will still speak in Rome. When we are living in faith, following God, we can know that God used all circumstances for His glory and He works in all things. Even what you are facing now. Secondly, hold on in the storm. Don't let go. As soon as the storm started, they were in great trouble. They were not able to keep the boat under control. So the next day, they began to throw all the cargo overboard. On the third day, they even threw the ship's tackle overboard to try and lighten the ship. Now it says that after many days, all hope of being saved was gradually abandoned. They lost hope. You know what the thing with storms are? Storms change your perspective. This is such a great analogy of life and difficult times. When storms come, one starts to evaluate what is important in life. One is willing to let go of the excess baggage weighing you down. To a certain degree, storms bring clarity and have a way of reorganizing your values. Reorganizing what you put your hope in. When all the things around you doesn't help, you start to prioritize. Where does my help come from? See, it changes your perspective. Things that used to be important are no longer important. You see things differently. I want to come back to our story. During that time, I was almost killed by a snake. We were in a situation where we were in danger of losing everything. But the one thing that was the most important to my wife and I was that we would hear the voice of God. In that moment, nothing else Mattered. I remember the time, you know, we all sing, All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. We sing it for so, forever until one day you're in front of that choice. And there was a moment where we came together and said, God, we surrender all. You are really all we need. In this situation, only you can save. We surrender 
it all. God kept us. Even in that, I can tell you that we, we it, it's such a long story, but quickly, what happened is, so God challenged us to go out of a system where we got our financial support as well. So our financial support was cut off. All our income was cut off. Everything was cut off. I said, God, I have three little kids, a wife, a mortgage, cars, everything. What's going to happen? And I literally opened my Bible and said, I look after the, the, the um, I'm trying to translate now, after the, the, the trees of the field and the, the birds of the air, will I not also look after you, ye of little faith? And I said, God, I will trust you. I phoned my wife and said, this is what's going to happen. She said, yes, I had a dream last night. God's telling me we're going in this direction. So, well, okay, here we go. For three years, not one check bounced. For three years, God looked after us. We would see in our bank account, someone just deposited money. Where did this come from? Every end of the month, God supplied. We kept on faithfully working, ministering. We were busy ministering to kids, traveling all over the country. God supplied. He's all you need. <laughs> and you know what? Later again, we were challenged with this when we moved to America. And we had to let go of everything. But in that space, it was so freeing. It was, to me, it was such a freeing thing to say all these things that you build up over 20, 30 years, it's nothing. We could let it go. Now, there were some personal heirlooms and trinkets and stuff and things we got from friends that was hard to leave behind. But even that said, you know what? When we die, we need to leave it anyway. God will supply. God will restore. I remember my wife went so far. We're very close to our parents. We love them dearly. They are um, godly people. And you know what happened? My wife said even, you know what? Even if I never see my mom again, I will see her in heaven. What an amazing heart of sacrifice of saying, God, you know. But you know what? God restored everything again. I tell you, we're moving in a month. I told my wife, you know how much stuff we accumulated in a year? What is happening? Our house is full again. God has been faithful. The church has been a blessing. People have just, it's just incredible how God is just, he's our source. He does amazing things. Can we praise God? Amen. See, when you've been through enough storms in your life, your perspective begins to become permanent. It changes. You begin to, begin to realize the most important thing in life is relationships. There's one thing you can take to heaven, that is relationships. You know what? That is how we impact the kingdom as well, through relationships. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourselves. You don't expand the kingdom by building a bigger building. The building is not the kingdom, it's the people. Relationships are all that matters. Matthew 6.20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. That's our greatest treasure. Our relationship to God and to other people. And then lastly, how we weather the storm is to trust God's word. See in verse 21 it says, by this time they had abandoned all hope. It seems like they even stopped eating. That's a place of no hope. But then Paul said, men, you ought to have followed my advice. You should not have set sail for Crete and incurred this damage, incurred this damage or loss. But then he continued to say that none of them would lose their lives, but they would only lose the ship. As God has appeared to him, an angel has appeared to him and said, you will still stand in Rome before God, and I will give in your hand every life on the ship. A word 
from God. See, these men had given up. They'd made a fatal mistake. There was no hope left. Thank God that he is the God of the impossible. When we think there's no hope left, God doesn't just abandon us. He says, no, it is not the end of the story. It's not over till God says it's over. Until while you still have breath in your lungs, there is still hope. Amen? Amen. And you know, God has given many words of life to all of us as well to hold on to. Even in the midst of storms, in the midst of our mistakes, there's always hope. So it says, after 14 days, they began to approach the land. Now, I want to tell you, if you've been in a violent storm for 14 days, can you think how seasick they were? Sick of the sea. So there were some trying to untie the lifeboat, trying to flee, trying to get off the ship. But Paul said, if any of them get off the ship, we, not, you will not be saved. So this time, the centurion listened to Paul. He stood in faith on Paul's word, the word that he received from God. And he cut off the ropes and he let the lifeboat go. He says, we will listen to Paul this time. And this is a great lesson. When God has spoken, it's important to trust the word that he has spoken. Do not get in other lifeboats. Many people climb in other lifeboats instead of standing on the word of God. Discern God's plan, stand in faith. Because some storms you just have to ride out. You cannot avoid them. You can't get away from them. You need to stay steady. And this is where we need the truth of God's word written on our hearts so that they guard our hearts and minds. One of my favorite scriptures, I will quote this many times in this church again, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing. May I ask by show of hands, if you don't want, you don't have to, who sometimes get anxious? Even though we know these scriptures, we sometimes get anxious. It's part of being human. But remind, we need to remind ourselves of these things. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Amplified says it this way, it will mount a garrison around your mind. The peace of God. I literally see a gazillion horses running around my mind, mounting a garrison against the lies of the enemy, standing there, the peace of God, guarding my mind. We need to be anchored in that. See, then Paul urged them to eat, taking bread, broke the bread, gave thanks, and said, eat. Now, on a side note, this showed us that when they did not eat, it was not because they did not have food. They chose not to eat because they gave up. There was food on the ship. And the principle here is when Paul broke the bread, it's a picture of the word. It's a picture of eating. When you're in a storm, don't stop eating the word. Stay in the word. Because the temptation is to say, I'm done. I'm just going to lay in a corner till I die. When you feel like that, stay in the Word. Stay on the promises. Read it. Keep it. Eat it. Strengthen your soul. And then lastly, we see God uses storms for His glory. Now this ship ran aground and the stern was smashed to pieces, yet God has promised that all, had promised that all will be saved. So we read that the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners, but the centurion wanted to save Paul. So he gave a command and said, do not kill them. And then it was fulfilled what God said. All 276 of them made it to shore. They were all saved. 
There's a few lessons in this. Firstly, your presence has a saving impact on those around you. Because you are a beloved, favored one of God, your presence has an impact on the people around you. Our lives, when we stand in faith, it gives hope to others. It gives them direction. Others are blessed because you are in their lives. Secondly, God still had a purpose for Paul's life that had to be fulfilled. God would watch over his word. He will perform it and he will get to his purpose. Thirdly, God's name was glorified through this whole ordeal. Even though they made bad decisions, even though they made mistakes, God used the storm to show his glory. Where it seemed impossible for all to be saved, God saved them. And he said it beforehand. So because Paul said it and God did it, God was glorified. He proved he was the one true God. So in closing, through this whole ordeal, Paul kept a different perspective. Paul kept a different perspective. Lord, this is my prayer. Let me have a different perspective. Let me see differently. When other people see troubles, let me see differently. When other people see storms, Lord, let us see differently. Let us see what you see. He had a word from God. He stood unwavering, knowing that God will fulfill his promises. I want to tell you, when all hope seems lost, we can stand on God's word. He's able to perform That which is impossible. Whatever is in your life today that seems impossible, nothing is impossible for God. If you're in a storm now, hold on. Stand on God's word. He's our safety. He's our anchor in the storm. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your wonderful word that gives us hope. Thank you that you strengthen us. Thank you that you Encourage us, Lord, that we can take courage from the truth in your word. Lord, even though we're in a storm, sometimes when we see things that's frightening, we know that you are still the king over the flood. You are the king even over the storm. Lord, our one prayer tonight is that you will give us a different perspective. Lord, let us not look at the natural things or the things that want to scare us, the storms of this life and become discouraged. Give us a different perspective like Paul, grounded in your word, knowing that you are for us. You are not against us. Even though we go through this, Lord, that you are, you are changing us, renewing us. You're strengthening our faith. You're growing us towards greater things. Thank you that your eye of love is over us. You're watching over us. You're watching over your word to perform it in our lives. I want to pray for people in this place tonight. Lord, I pray for a new courage where they have become discouraged. People that feel that the storm is overwhelming. Lord, that we will see you as the king over the storm. Lord, that just like the disciples, when the storm was raging, you are still on the boat. You're still there. And you command the storms. Thank you for faith rising up in hearts now. Thank you for your love and your peace flooding us. People that are anxious, Lord, we come and lay these things down before your throne. All the things that want to make us anxious, lay it down before your throne, surrendering it to you. And we pray that your peace will mount garrison over our hearts and our minds. We honor you for that in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer tonight, say, Lord, help me see with a different perspective. 
Just raise your hands to God and say, God, here I am. Let me see what you see. Lord, come and strengthen my heart. Come and stir faith. Come and flood me with your peace. That my life will be a holy praise unto you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Can we praise God for His loving kindness, His word?